Welcome everyone to Dreams Unzipped, where we uncover the beauty of your dreams to discover the truth and the beauty of who you are. I'm Dr. Dream, Kelly Sullivan Walden, and I'm so excited to bring an amazing guest to you. If you haven't already met him or know of him, you're going to be truly delighted. We're going to talk about something that is essential, not necessarily to nighttime dreams, but to having a dream life or to having a, a life that has you have to know how to de-escalate, de-escalate. This is a topic that is very, hits very close to my, my heart um, because I am a Leo. I'm very intense and I can get escalated in the past. And I've this, this, I can't get enough of this. And I feel like this is helpful to me personally. And if I know it's going to help me personally, I know it will help all of you. All right. So who I'm talking to today, if you're watching, you can already see his handsome face. This is Douglas Knoll. So based on Douglas Knoll's practical world experience, he was a lawyer turned peacemaker. Um, he left a successful career as a trial lawyer to become a peacemaker. Now, this is not a common thing. This, this takes an act of, of conscience and consciousness. He is an award-winning author, teacher, trainer, and highly experienced mediator. Noel's work carries him from the international arena to helping people resolve deep interpersonal and ideological conflicts. Noel co-founded Prison of Peace in 2009, which is already integrated into 10 California prisons and is continuing to be adopted into prisons domestically and internationally. And this is one of the most exciting things I've heard. I'm, it just gives so much hope. There's so much sorrow. Um, you turn on the news, and I guess it's always like that. You always, bad news, if it bleeds, it leads. So people tend to think the world's going to hell in a handbasket. But we meet somebody like you, Douglas Knoll, author of Deescalate, How to Calm an Angry Person in 90 Seconds or Less. Mm. And we, there's hope. There's hope for us all. So, Douglas, let's start with this. How you, just a little bit of your transition from being a trial lawyer, a very well-paid, very successful trial lawyer, to becoming a peacemaker. Well, it was a journey, to tell you the truth, Kelly. Uh, <laughs> I graduated from law school in 1977 and clerked for a year for a judge and then went into private practice as a brand new associate in a law firm. And they groomed me to be a trial lawyer so that I started in the firm in September of 1977. And I tried my first jury trial in November of 1977 or 1978. Um, so uh, it was two months from the time I joined the law firm to the time I was staying in the courtroom in front of my first jury. Mm. For the next 22 years, I was a trial lawyer and I tried cases all over the United States, mostly commercial cases, but my practice was really defined by what I didn't do. I didn't do criminal law, I didn't do family law, and I didn't do personal injury. But I litigated just about everything else. Along the way, and uh, in the mid-1980s, I took on um, the martial arts. And I started studying a Northern Chinese Kung Fu style that's very vicious. And by the time I was 40, I was a second degree black belt. And my teacher called me in and said, you're done here. You're too arrogant, you're too violent, you're too full of yourself, you're gonna hurt somebody and you're gonna hurt yourself. So you, I'm not gonna teach you anymore until you master Tai Chi. Well, that was a death sentence because you never master Tai Chi. It's like the idea that it has no center. So I started studying Tai Chi and it had two paradoxes that were really confusing to me. The first paradox is the softer you are, the stronger you are, soft to be strong. And the second paradox is the more vulnerable you are, the more powerful you are. Mm, Soft to be strong, vulnerable to be powerful. Well, so in the true. beginning, this, this did not compute. But, <laughs> but eventually it did. And one day, some years later, I was in the courtroom trying a case, cross-examining somebody, and the thought came to me, what the heck am I doing in here? So after that trial, I had a vacation plan to run uh, the main salmon up in Idaho, a 10-day river trip. And I spent the week powering through the big rapids on the main salmon, thinking about how many people I'd really served as a trial lawyer. And I concluded that I hadn't really served that many people and that this was really not my calling. Mm -hmm. 
So when I came back after that trip, I was driving down out of the mountains to my office, and I heard the one and only public service announcement for a new master's degree program in peacemaking and conflict studies being offered at Fresno Pacific University, which is the West Coast Mennonite University. And the Mennonites are one of the three traditional peace churches mm -hmm. in the Protestant faith. Uh, it caught my attention, and I checked it out, and I enrolled. And these guys completely turned my head around. I came to realize that the legal system and our, and our, our, our legal system is incredibly important to our society and to our democracy, but it's not well suited for a lot of conflicts that people bring to it. Mm. It's very well suited for certain kinds of conflicts, but other conflicts it's not well suited for at all. And that's why people were so frustrated. I, I, I do this brilliant legal work for them and win the case and they'd be angry at me because they didn't get what they were looking for. And then they mm. wouldn't do my bill and it just got, you know, it was just awful. Mm. And so uh, I started studying to become a peacemaker. And for the next three years, I was a full-time master's student while holding on to my law practice as a full-time trial lawyer. And I was a three-quarters time law professor at the same time. My I was kind of, it was a little nutty. But <laughs> what happened was that I realized that there were many other ways to resolve conflict other than through litigation. And so I quit the practice law. I literally gave my firm a week's notice and uh, left the practice and in November 1st, 2000, started my own mediation and peacemaking practice. And that's how it started. And I don't make nearly the money I used to make as a trial lawyer, but I help more people in a week than I helped in two years as a lawyer. Uh, mm. It's amazing mm. service work. And mm. along the way, I, w I became a student of neuroscience. And so everything that I do is based on how our brains process information, particularly around peace and conflict and communication. And so if, it, if I can't find science to support what I'm doing, then I don't do it. And, I, and, and there are a lot, in my business, there are a lot of myths and a lot of uh, conventional wisdom that's just plain wrong. And mm. uh, I've learned over the years to, to rely on science to guide me. So it's empirically based work. And, and so the book Deescalate is a synthesis of my work to date of how do we really calm people down and can we do it effectively in 90 seconds or less? And the answer is yes, we can, if we know specifically the three steps we have to take every time to do it. Okay. Well, then let's talk about the three steps that okay. we have to do. Give right. it to me. Well, you're going to have to get out a pencil and paper and write down because there's going to be a quiz. There's going to be a quiz. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm, gonna I'm, a law, I'm a law professor. <laughs> I'm going to tattoo it to my head. All right. Here it is. Step okay. number one. When you're confronted with somebody who is really, really angry, ignore the words. Yes. The next 90 seconds, ignore the words. It's just noise. It has nothing to do with anything that you're going to be doing. Ignore the noise. Yes. It's Step no and when you do that, that will keep you from getting escalated yourself. So ignore the words. Second thing to do, guess at what they're feeling in this moment. What are their emotions? Sure, it's anger, but what else might there be there? Frustration, anxiety, fear, sadness, grief. I mean, there are mm -hmm. a lot, no, emotions never come just one at a time. They come in layers and complexes. And so, mm -hmm. so there's maybe one presenting emotion, but there's gonna be a lot of stuff underneath it too. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. third step, and this is the one that's really counterintuitive and easy to say and sometimes a little hard to do until you've practiced a little bit, reflect back the emotion you think the speaker is feeling with a simple you statement. So Kelly, you're really happy right now. You're really excited. <laughs> I am. You're hopeful. You're really hopeful that maybe some of my work will change the world. Yes. And that makes you really excited. Yes. You're good. Wow. You see, you see how simple that is? It's so simple. Now, the key is, now, I, there's, this is really cool. We're on video so people can see this because yes. you did something that is, absolutely happens every single time when you do it right. <laughs> and it's automatic and it's unconscious and you don't even know that you did it. Mm, so what did I do? You, you, first of all, you went up and down. You nodded your head. This, the second thing you did was you said, yeah. The third <laughs> thing you did was you went, <sighs> a big release, mm -hmm. and I watched yeah. your shoulders drop. Yeah. Those four things happen every single time you listen to somebody in this way because for the first time, they are feeling validated at a very deep level. Right. Right. That is such a simple thing, and it does – it's it's almost like I, – I heard that um, – I'm not exactly sure in which dialect, um, but it's a Native American dialect that when, instead of saying, I love you, you the exact translation is, I see you. Right. So, so, so that's great because the phrase that I use is listening 
you into existence. I'm listening you into existence. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Okay, so here, I took notes. Here's okay. what I've got. All so right. step number one, when confronted with a escalated person, ignore the words. It's just noise. Exactly. Don't listen to the content of what they said. Right. Number two, guess at what they're feeling. It'll probably, it might be anger or something, but there's layers and layers. So sadness, grief, hurt, whatever it else, just guess at what it is. And then the third thing would be to reflect that back to them. Use you it. are, yeah. you, you, Doug, <laughs> look hopeful that I am understanding what you're I'm saying. I'm excited. Yeah, you're I'm ex excited that you're getting you're it. You're excited and that's, it gives you hope that there's other people on the planet that are going to receive this. Yeah, it makes elixir. me really happy to see you figure it out. And it's, it's almost ecstatic. Your eyes are shining and sparkling yeah, and you're absolutely. smiling and glowing. And, and look at the reaction you're getting from me. And I can't help myself. I have to say yes, absolutely. You know, this is just an interesting aside on a personal level. I, um, I w was an actress during my 20s and um, during the roaring 20s, my 20s, my roaring 20s. And I studied a method called the Meisner method. Sandy Meisner was the teacher. And it's one of his staple exercises that he teaches the actors to do to the, it's called the repetition exercise. Have you ever heard of this? No. So you get two actors up on a stage and there's no script, there's no scene, nothing at all, but they're just standing in front of each other, observing each other. So you have blue eyes, you're wearing a gray shirt, you have a blackish green background, you look you look certain, you look quizzical. And so both would go back and forth and just, and within a few minutes, and you say this, it's like you, the person who's doing the reflecting, you lose your ego. That's right. And then all of a sudden from an acting perspective, now you're a vessel. And then they say, okay, script. Now you add the script to whatever is there because you're, you're not like, you're not there anymore. And to me, I oh, get the chills being good at de-escalating is, is the willingness to let go of the ego. That's right. And it happens automatically. We don't have to be, we have to be willing to, to listen. Yeah. But, but when we listen, our egos will dissolve automatically because there's no room in our brain for doing anything other than being with, in the presence of the other person. So this is, this by definition means that if it's difficult for you to do this, and I'm talking to myself, it means that my ego doesn't want to get out of the space. It's so like, what about the, me? Here's right. the secret, right. Two things to say about that. Number one, when you practice this and master it in a, in a week or two, it will, <laughs> it will automatically do It's like riding a bike. This is not something you can just read a book, read my book. You have to practice it. And I talk mm -hmm. about that. Um, number one, you don't have to worry about your ego because it will dissolve. Mm -hmm. and, number, and number two, when it dissolves, you will enter a state of what the Buddhists call samadhi, which is this transcendent oneness with the other person. So it's a deep spiritual practice, as well as being a pragmatic peacemaking process. Well, interestingly, back in that acting class, so many people fell in love and would make out after class because it was <laughs> like, oh, I love you. You see right? me. I'm I'm, all, I'm so alive. And it That's wasn't right. necessarily because in any other circumstance they would find that, but literally there would be like, there was so much passion just oh, yeah. because people felt, like you said, um, they're spoken into existence. Or listened they're into existence. Listened into existence. So one of the things that's really funny is I teach, I teach at Pepperdine, not too far from where you live. And in, right. my, gradu in my graduate classes, um, I typically have young women in my classes and I always warn them when I teach them this technique, be very careful. And mm -hmm. sure enough, on a, on a, I teach the class on a Friday and they go on, on Friday night and they come back Saturday morning. And I say, well, tell me what happened, how to go out there. Cause I give them homework assignments and invariably a woman will come in and say, well, I was in the line at Starbucks this morning and a guy behind me dropped all his papers on the floor and I turned around and I started picking up the papers and I looked at me and I said, you're really embarrassed right now. You're really feeling like kind of foolish because you dropped all these papers and you're grateful that I'm here helping you pick them up. And he said, I couldn't get this guy off me. He started hitting on me like, just like you said he would. He started, and she started cracking up. Yeah, there's a power in that. It's That's like, right. 
people feel loved and then they say wow this happens so actually sees you that they have they glom on and they want that okay well so this is great as a secondary thing for anybody who's who's not in a romantic relationship and wants to be and wants a you know this is a little trick up your sleeve not that you want to use it manipulatively um you can use well, anything it won't, work. it won't work if you're manipulative you have oh because that means your ego is back in this place uh, and then right. it won't work ah oh it's that's self-correcting. good correcting you can't use this for ill because it will not work as a manipulation oh that's good that's good okay so here's where i get stuck if i'm with my husband for example and he says or does something that triggers me but mm-hmm. he said it because he was triggered. Right. So I'm, if I'm triggered, it's not as easy Correct. to just behold without my ego what's going on when there's some feeling of like my limbic brain has been That's activated. Right. That's right. That's right. So, so what this, do you do there? This is where you have to be an adult. <laughs> yeah. what? I don't want to be an adult. He started it. <laughs> where it takes some discipline because even when you're triggered, you recognize the only way out of this mess is for me to take responsibility for listening, even though I have a deep need to be listened to myself. And so I will listen first and then get my needs met later. Mm. And, then, and then what you will find is if you, take, if you act in that disciplined way, your needs will get met once you get your husband de-escalated. And interesting. you should give him the book and teach him the skills so that when you need to be, le- when you need to be listened to, he knows how to do it. You know it. Exactly. Well, we actually have, it's a funny thing because we have been surrounded by um, nonviolent communication experts. So I'm sure. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of parallel. um, And I, between the work. And that there's observation. There are a lot of of myths out there. I've taken NBC classes and I've always challenged those people. Where's the science to support your work? And they don't have any. Mm. Yeah, I frankly they use a lot of I statements. And in, in, yes, yes, and there yes. are no I statements. You cannot use an I statement to de-escalate somebody. So, so unpack that, unravel sure. that. What do you mean so by suppose, an I statement? The typical, the typical active listening practitioner, whether it's NBC or somebody else, will say, "Gee, what I think you're feeling is anger." Now, let me let me just experiment here, Kelly. What I think you're feeling is anger versus Kelly. Kelly, you're really angry. Do you feel the difference between the two? Yes. And I can see how, I, I think, I mean, if I was really angry, I'd like to try that out. So can I call you the next time I'm angry Absolutely. so you could do that? Here's the, here's the, here's the difference. <laughs> Absolutely. We, we, we use I statements to soothe our own anxiety. Mm. Okay. Because when we're in the presence of somebody who's really emotional, if we're not well-trained, we tend to be anxious. Yes. We don't know what's going to happen. So to protect ourselves, we say, I, I, me, me, I. We are t- the way I teach this is to say that there are two tracks. There's the listener's track and the speaker's track. As long as I'm using a you statement, I'm on the speaker's track. The moment mm-hmm. I use an I statement, I'm taking the train off the speaker's track and putting it on my track. And now it becomes all about me, not about the speaker. Mm, mm. So it's. Critical. I think it feels. I think it feels a little scary. It to is scary. Say, you're yeah. hurt. You're uh-huh. angry. You must be upset. It just. It seems like they would say. Now, that's the second thing. We don't ask questions. No rising inflection. Oh, okay. So say you wouldn't more. say, "Oh, are you angry?" You wouldn't do that. You would say, "You are angry." Now, what happens if you're wrong? Beautiful things happen if you're wrong. <laughs> because if you're wrong, your speaker is going to correct you immediately. You're angry. No, I'm not angry. I'm really frustrated. Oh, you're really frustrated. Yeah, I'm really frustrated. Mm. And that's all there okay. is to it. So it's actually more simple. I mean, I, 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 I don't want to put down nonviolent communication because no, no, I think that inc- they've done. It's incredibly some, simple. But and it feels like it's more. Yeah. It, this, is, this is proven by brain science. Matthew Lieberman, okay. a neuroscientist at UCLA, did a study in 2007 looking at a bunch of brains under the scanners and how, what happened when they got emotional. And he used all kinds of different techniques. And the only one that really worked to calm down the limbic system, the emotional centers of the brain, was affect labeling. Simply labeling the emotion with a use statement. Nothing else worked. Everything else escalated the emotional systems. Mm. And when, you, when, he found, when he had his associates affect label, 
the person in the machine, their emotional centers immediately quieted down and their prefrontal cortex came right back online. That was the only skill that worked. Nothing else worked. There, this is interesting. Um, I don't know if this is something that you would recommend, but a friend of mine did something similar. And I think maybe there's a correlation. It's a little bit strange, but she had a son that was that every once in a while would just have these phenomenal anger, anger outbursts that would be rageful. And I mean, he'd be inconsolable. It was like he was off the, off the rafters and she was really scared and upset, obviously. And one time when it was happening, she grabbed her phone and started videotaping him. And he all of a sudden, it's like it snapped him out of. Oh, there you go. Interesting. And it, was, it was like he was being seen. He was being, he knew that he was being observed. Right. And there was something about that that, and, and it stopped, it stopped that behavior. I don't know that it was the best thing, but it stopped it. Well, Obser well, well, here's what's going on. There's an explanation for that, I think. And that is that when we become angry and upset and emotional, the emotional centers of our brain are taking over everything because the whole purpose yep. of emotions is to make us pay attention to our environment. Hey, there's something out there that's dangerous. And so we, and our brain, there are parts of our brain that cannot distinguish between a physical threat and a social threat. So at a primal level, it's as if we're being attacked by a saber-toothed tiger. Well, when, that, when that's happening, you can't think. You can't, there's no rationality. And, and you're locked into this programming until it passes. So probably by picking up the phone, it broke the cycle for a second. Right. And, and he was able to get out of it and back into, back into thinking again. Mm -hmm. when, we, when, we, when we label emotions, the same thing happens, only it, it's more, much more predictable and it never fails because the brains are hardwired to absorb that information. We are literally loaning our prefrontal cortex to the speaker oh. so that they can process oh. the information themselves because otherwise they couldn't process it because their prefrontal cortex is all locked up. Uh, so when I label uh, your emotion, I'm giving you information that you're now able to start processing very quickly your emotions quiet down and now we can move into problem solving as your brain comes back online. If you mm. use an I statement, it doesn't work. If you ask a question, it doesn't work. But if I use mm. a direct you statement, it does work. Our brains are quirky that way. So tell us about the prison project. The prison, ah. uh, this is incredible. The women's, so tell people about this project. So <laughs> since 2009, my colleague, Laurel Coffer, and Laurel lives up in the San Fernando Valley, uh, and I have been working in California prisons teaching lifers and long-term inmates, many of them have killed people, to be uh, peacemakers and mediators. And we've worked, we are now in 10 prisons in California. We have a colleague in Greece who's got it going in six to nine prisons in Greece. Um, and we go take our inmates through a very intensive training regimen, starting with these de-escalation techniques, because they are gonna be going into potentially violent situations and they need to de-escalate somebody right now, first time, every time, no, no room for error, lives are at stake. So that's why these techniques are so powerful, is because they, mm -hmm. always, they always work. So we take them through and we teach them how to listen and how to communicate and how to solve problems. We teach them how to do peace circles. And then once they've got a lot of experience, we train them to be mediators. And then from there, we teach them how to be trainers so they can train other inmates in their yards how to do the same work they're doing. And we've trained over, in the last nine years, seven years, we've trained over a thousand inmates in these skills in nine California prisons. What does this do for them? It completely changes them. Because for the first time, they now have choices about how to respond to violence and disrespect. The, before we train them, typically, if they're in for life, they've killed somebody. And it's because the only choice they knew was violence. And now we're showing them that there are many, many other choices you have in front of you. We're also teaching them emotional intelligence. As you learn how to label another person's emotions, you're learning mm. the last two parts of emotional intelligence, which is how to recognize emotions in another and then how to create an empathic connection. As they do that, they become self-aware around their own emotions. They're able to modulate their emotions and they're able to have impulse control. It develops automatically. And our project is all about service. We, it's not a self-help program. Uh, we tell the inmates coming in, this is all, all about learning how to serve humanity. If you don't want to serve humanity, if you don't want to serve the people in your population for the rest of your lives, then this program is not for you. This is all about you learning how to serve other people in really powerful ways. And for many of them, it's the first time they've ever thought about serving another person. 
And as they learn how to solve problems and as they gain confidence in their skills and they get mastery, their whole, they, they change. I mean, their whole lives change. And in fact, of the first 15 women that we trained at what was then Valley State Prison for Women, which was the largest, most violent women's prison in the world at the time, fifth, uh, of the 15, seven have been released and are doing great. We've had about 400, between 400 and 600 inmates that we've trained or have been paroled. We what? have zero, zero reports of recidivism, no reoffending by anybody that we've heard of, that we've heard of. That is absolutely astounding. That's incredible. And I know you're now working, you're working in men's prisons as well. We, right. We're working in both women's prisons and we also have projects going in six men's prisons throughout the Central Valley and all the way out to the desert in Blythe. And, um, have you ever been scared? Have you ever, like, did it ever look like it was going to go off the rails? I you mean, know, what's, first of all, I'm a secondary black belt, so there isn't much that scares me. But okay. Laurel, I mean, she's a woman. And, and so, but here's the thing. What we have learned is that after the first couple of sessions of training, these inmates are so loyal to us, they will lay down their lives for us because they realize the gift we're giving them. And we have never, ever had a problem. We've, there have been times when yards have been locked down and there's been stuff going on outside, but the, we just get locked in the room with them and we're good to go. And they, they're some of the best students I've ever worked with. This I mean, must be... Um rewarding shall we say with a capital r it is very it's very difficult challenging work working inside a prison but yes it's very rewarding because we're watching lives change right in front of us every moment i have so many stories of how for example men for the first time have been able to have deep conversations with their wives on the telephone because they're listening they've been able to have conversations with their children mm. because they're listening to their children not telling their children what to do that, that it's completely changed their whole family dynamic. Um, I, we've had reconciliations. Of course, we've had inmates stop gang riots on yards using these skills. I mean, it's really amazing what they've there done. There was one story in here. I don't have the page picked. Um, I, there was so much that I picked, but there was one story about a woman who, who hadn't talked to her son. Her yes. son wouldn't talk to her. And after right. just one session with you, she practiced listening. And then her son all of a sudden... Or, what happened with that? Well, that was in our very first training. And that oh, was, it was in a letter. Yes, and it was in April in 2010. And we came into the training room. We'd been training now for about three or four weeks and had taught this de-escalation skill. And this woman was in the conference room where we were teaching, kind of very dingy place, dark. And she was crying, quietly sobbing. And mm -hmm. so Laurel, Laurel went over to her and I followed. And Laurel said, well, what's going on? And she said... I've been in prison for 10 years. When I came to prison, I, I had to turn my son over to my sister and she's been raising him. I've written him every week for that I've been in prison. I've never gotten a letter back from him. Said last week, I decided to write a different kind of letter using your skills. And I just tried to imagine what he must feel like with his mother in prison being raised by his aunt. And so I wrote a whole letter all about how he must feel. And... I got a letter back from him today and he's coming to visit in two weeks with his girlfriend. She listened him into existence. Exactly. Even in a letter. And that was, that was the first time that we had gotten a reaction to this. And I said, Holy crap, what is going on here? <laughs> wow. It is beautiful. That is beautiful. Well, we all need this. I mean, I, I know I need it in my, in my day-to-day -day life with the people that I'm closest with, I want to, you know, be a more peaceful person, but I feel like we just need to spread this around. This so is let, me, let me give some suggestions because it is, although the three steps are really easy to talk about, they're difficult to do for the reasons that you yeah. mentioned, there's a certain fear involved. We're acculturated against emotions and it seems almost presumptuous to tell yes. someone what they're feeling. Exactly. Even though science tells us, and we know from practical experience, that, that people really don't know what they're feeling. We think that they should know what they're feeling, but they don't. Uh, so the way that I tell people to do this, to, to approach this, is to practice in really low risk, safe social situations. So it's great, great practicing on the dog. <laughs> Doggies, doggies <laughs> love it. Go to Starbucks. You know, go, to a, go to your coffee place in the morning, and when you're getting coffee, look at the barista and say, hey, you look really happy this morning. Mm. Totally safe. 
and watch what happens and become the observer mm. and watch what happens when you affect label something very simple like that. And you'll see the four reactions we're talking about, the nod of the head, the yes, the, the dropping the shoulders and even saying something like, you seem really happy this morning. And after you do this a number of times over a period of weeks, you'll start to see, hey, this stuff really works. And then that will yeah. give you the courage to go a little deeper. And maybe you can try it out on your kid, just a throwaway. Hey, you seem really tired today. You seem really sad today. You seem really, you seem really happy today. Just a throwaway. Make it very conversational. Put no investment in it and mm -hmm. watch what happens. Mm -hmm. And over a period of weeks, as you practice this and you see the results, you will mm -hmm. get the positive feedback that will tell you that this is very special stuff. That's wonderful. I'm, it feels like it might be easier to catch somebody when they're feeling good than to oh, yes. kind of like catch somebody when I know somebody, a friend of mine said, oh, you look tired. Or, and I was like, no, thank you. Like, no, thank you. <laughs> that didn't, that right. wasn't helpful. Right. So, <laughs> so I think you're right. We can, this works with both positive and negative emotions. Yeah. And so start with happy stuff. <laughs> because you'll get that you'll get great reactions you'll get That's the same great. reaction and it will teach you you'll still get that deep connection your your ego will dissolve everything will happen you're just dealing with a positive emotion not a negative one so it's a little easier to work with it's not so right. intimidating it feels like if i wish i was a, a genie and i could just go ding and just kind of make this the rules that we grew up in that this is how we communicate so that it was accepted so that it was collective and and so that it didn't seem strange, so that it didn't seem strange to speak that way or to receive it ever. And so that there could be that, so there wasn't this right. inhibited, uh, there's like an inhibition, I know, for that, that third step. But even if, I think even if I don't get to the third step, and hopefully I will, I'm going to work on this. But even the first two steps de-escalates me in some way. And, and I think in being a de-escalated listener or observer, that's, I think there's something even in that. So even if a person is too scared to get to three, which I hope they aren't because I'm going to work on this and hopefully everybody else will too. I think that even the first two steps are helpful. So how can people reach you and what, what kind of workshops do you have coming up? How can people get involved in your, um, in your work? All right. So, so the way to get to me is through my website, dougnoll.com. And actually I have a, a free book offer. If you're willing to pay the shipping, um, you can get that's very generous. I have a benefactor who has put up the money to buy the books. You pay the shipping, we'll buy the book. And if you do that, then you'll get a one-time offer for my online video course if people want to get more in-depth training. Uh, my next workshop, I'm going to be teaching at, um, I'm going to be teaching in Nashville. Actually, I've got teaching two workshops this fall. One at, at the Peace Palace in The Hague in the Netherlands oh, in the what? first week of October. That's incredible. Teaching, I'm going to be teaching lawyers and judges and diplomats this stuff. And then I will be in Nashville at Lipscomb University for Pepperdine. And that workshop is open to anybody willing to pay. Uh, and that'll be a three-day, a two-and-a-half-day workshop where we're going to go deep into both de-escalation and problem solving and decision making. This is such valuable, important work. Thank you so much, Doug Knoll, for writing De-Escalate, How to Calm an Angry Person in 90 Seconds or Less. This has been so helpful, so important. You know, we don't need necessarily help doing the lofty things. We just need help getting out of our own way and getting out of That's right. those potholes. And I think this is so important and the work you're doing in prisons is so admirable. So thank you everyone for watching and or listening and deep listening and true listening. Go forth and multiply these blessings. Don't take your dreams lying down and I'll see you next time on Dreams Unzipped.